Hello, and welcome back to the Wolfston. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to a Song of Ice and Fire. So who is Halden Halfmaster? Everyone else of substance on the Shy Maid is operating under an alias, so it seems logical to assume that Halden is an alias as well. Now, the most common theory is that he's a high tower, and to that I would say that you're half right. He's half a high tower and half a maester, just as his name implies. Now I bet a lot of you are wondering where I came up with this crazy idea. So let me explain. In Catelyn's second point of view chapter from A Game of Thrones, she indicates that there is no need for false modesty as she stands naked in front of Maester Lewin, because he had delivered all five of her children. This is a subtle clue that Maester Lewin was at River Run with Catelyn when she gave birth to Rob therefore making him the maester in service at River Run during the rebellion. Lewin accompanying Catelyn from one castle to another seems logical enough, as it would seem prudent to have a maester on hand as she travels with her infant son, the presumed heir to Winterfell. But the real question is, why did he end up staying there? Well, prior to the rebellion, the maester in Winterfell was a man named Wallace Flowers. We learn this in a Theon chapter from A Dance with Dragons from Barbary Dustin, who explains to Theon her feelings of disdain for maesters in general and tells him about Wallace. Maester Wallace was his gray rat's name. And isn't it clever how the maesters go by only one name, even those who had two when they first arrived at the Citadel? That way we cannot know who they truly are or where they come from. But if you are dogged enough, you can still find out. Before he forged his chain, Maester Wallace had been known as Wallace Flowers. Flowers, hill, rivers, snow. We give such names to baseborn children to mark them for what they are. But they are always quick to shed them. Wallace Flowers had a high tower girl for a mother, and an arc maester of the Citadel for a father, it was rumored. The gray rats are not as chaste as they would have us believe. Old Town Maesters are the worst of all. Once he forged his chain, his secret father and his friends wasted no time dispatching him to Winterfell to fill Lord Rickard's ears with poisoned words as sweet as honey. The Tully marriage was his notion, never doubt it. So this gives us a general idea on who Wallace Flowers was, but not specifically which Archmaester was his father or which Hightower woman was his mother, or what the heck happened to him. Now, we don't ever use a wiki of Westeros, but if you look on his page, it indicates that he was either presumed dead or missing sometime during the year 283. Now, given that their timeline for this period is about a year off by our calculations, it is reasonable to assume that his disappearance and or death could have been into the year 284 the year that we believe the war ended and Ned found Lyanna in her bed of blood. So we know very little about the Maesters and the Citadel, but are given some crumbs in the prologue of A Feast for Crows, where we believe the answer to our question of which Maester is Wallace's father can be found. In the prologue, we meet Pate, an acolyte who's directly in service to Arc Maester Walgrave, who tends to the Ravens. According to Pate, while Walgrave cannot remember the names of people, he has no trouble telling one raven from another. Everyone said that Walgrave had forgotten more of Ravencraft than most maesters ever knew, so Pate assumed that a black iron link was the least he could hope for, only to find out that Walgrave could not grant him one. The old man remained an archmaester only by courtesy. As great a maester as once he'd been, now his robes concealed soiled small clothes oft as not, and half a year ago some acolytes found him weeping in the library, unable to find his way back to his chambers. So Pate is totally in love with a waitress at a local tavern, whose mother is offering her maidenhead up to the first man who can pay a golden dragon for it. Pate clearly has no coin, but happens to meet a man, who we later find out is Jack and Hagar, who offers him a golden dragon in exchange for Walgrave's Archmaester's key, which can open any door at the Citadel. Now, in order to get the key, he breaks into his strongbox, where he finds an array of random items, 
some of which are pertinent to our discussion about Wallace and his mysterious parentage. Inside, Pate found a bag of silver stags, a lock of yellow hair tied up in a ribbon, a painted miniature of a woman who resembled Walgrave, even to her mustache, and a knight's gauntlet made of lobstered steel. The gauntlet had belonged to a prince, Walgrave claimed, though he could no longer recall which one. When Pate shook it, the key fell onto the floor. Now the question is, why does he have a lock of yellow hair in his strongbox? And even more importantly, whose is it? Well, Jorah Mormont was previously married to Lynesse Hightower, who, according to Daisy Mormont, had hair like spun gold. Now, rumors have it that Leighton Hightower has been holed up in the Hightower for the past decade with his daughter, Malora, the Mad Maid. Given how old Leighton Hightower is said to be, his daughter is likely an older woman, making her of an age with Walgrave. Isn't it a bit odd that a daughter of a family as esteemed as Hightower is not married? Well, if she had a bastard with a young acolyte at the Citadel when she was younger, it might explain the lack of suitors and provide us with the two likeliest candidates for Wallace's parents, Walgrave and Malora. It seems that Walgrave may be an important character moving forward, given the fact that George R. R. Martin pays homage to him in the A World of Ice and Fire forward. In the book, George R. R. Martin is said to be providing information through the voice of Maester Yandel, and he states, I was raised as a servant myself, amongst the halls and chambers and libraries, but I was given the gift of letters by Archmaster Walgrave. Thus did I come to know and love the Citadel, and the knights of the mind who guarded its precious wisdom. I desired nothing more than to become one of them, to read of far places and long dead men, to gaze at the stars and measure the passing of seasons. So, it is our belief that Halden Halfmaester is actually Wallace Flowers, the bastard son of Lady Malora Hightower and Archmaester Walgrave, making him the Winterfell Maester just prior to the Rebellion. That still doesn't explain what he's doing on the Shy Maid, so let's review who is traveling with him on the Shy Maid to see how he could tie into this plotline. There's John Connington, under the guise of Griff. According to his story, he stole from the Golden Company and is said to have been drinking himself to death ever since. Aegon Targaryen, under the guise of Young Griff, who claims to be the presumed dead son of Elia and Rhaegar, but as we explained in our Prince That Was Promised playlist, is likely the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna. Ashara Dane, under the guise of Septa Lamor, who is also presumed dead. Tyrion, under the guises of Yolo or Hugor, who is not yet presumed dead, but has a huge bounty out for his head. Yandri, Ysilla, and Duck seem to be inconsequential and therefore are not presumed anything. However, the main players aboard the Shy Maid are all operating under a false identity and are presumed dead. So, how would the Winterfell Maester end up serving young Griff and end up in the company of Ashara Dane and John Connington? Well, in order for us to answer that question, we have to start from the beginning. So in a Game of Thrones at Ard 4, Catelyn convinces Ned to enlist Littlefinger's support as they search to uncover the truth behind Jon Arryn's mysterious death, Bran's fall, and subsequent attack by the assassin. Ned reluctantly concedes to her wishes and thinks, That was not news Eddard Stark welcomed, but it was true enough that they needed help, and Littlefinger had been almost a brother to Cat once. It would not be the first time that Ned had been forced to make common cause with a man he despised. Very well, he said, thrusting the dagger into his belt. You spoke of Varys. Does the eunuch know all of it? So who is this person that Ned despised that he was forced to make common cause with? Well, we believe that it was Varys. And the reason we believe this is because of a thought that Ned had in the Game of Thrones at Ard 4. Upon his arrival in King's Landing, Ned is immediately summoned to a meeting of the small council, and as he enters the council chambers, he has the following thought. The counselor Ned like least, the eunuch Varys, accosted him the moment he entered. Now, 
We know very little about what took place after King's Landing fell to Tywin Lannister's army. But we do know for certain that a blowout fight took place between Ned and Robert over the deaths of Rhaegar and Elia's children. Now, it is likely that Varys would have witnessed this argument and saw this as an opportunity to enlist Ned's help in maintaining the safety of Lyanna and Rhaegar's baby. Now, Varys surely has the means to locate Lyanna, given his remarkable ability to find out virtually anything that's going on in the Seven Kingdoms, and he would then use this information to lure Ned into his conspiracy to protect the newborn infant, who he likely believed would be the prince that was promised. But why would Varys do this? Well, we know Varys has been involved in Aegon's upbringing, and we also know that Varys serves the realm. What other Targaryen from history do we know of who, on occasion, used somewhat questionable means to manipulate, control, and alter the fates of other fellow Targaryens in service to the realm, and served as the master of Whisperers for several kings? That's right, Bloodraven. It is our belief that Varys is a descendant of Bloodraven and Shiara Seastar, Bloodraven's beautiful half-sister whom he had a romantic relationship with and is working to continue what Bloodraven had started, which albeit remains one of the biggest mysteries in our story. Both men are characters who possess a somewhat arbitrary moral code, and seem to operate with the logic that if the ends justify the means, however heinous or amoral they may seem, then they are necessary for the good of the realm. Now, we aren't going to delve into too much about Bloodraven here, but if some of you would like us to do a video solely dedicated to his story, leave a comment below, and we'd be happy to do so. So, it is very likely that Ned did not trust Varys, and would therefore want to have someone he did trust in on the scheme. He then placed his own maester into the conspiracy, and ultimately convinced Ashara, who had recently given birth to his son John, to fake her death and go into hiding where she could pose as Aegon's mother. This would be possible because she has purple eyes and could easily pass as his mother, and having just given birth herself, could also care for the baby. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking that this would be impossible to orchestrate from Starfall, given the fact that Maester Wallace was likely still up in Winterfell. However, the current narrative surrounding the Tower of Joy makes absolutely no sense. Most of what we know about the Tower of Joy comes from a fever dream Ned had after he's attacked by Jamie Lannister and his men in King's Landing. Even George R. R. Martin has gone on the record as stating that Ned's recollection of the events at the Tower of Joy must be taken with a grain of salt as they are depicted through the, quote, context of a dream and a fever dream at that. So since George R. R. Martin explicitly states that Ned's fever dream should not be considered an accurate depiction of the events surrounding Lyanna and her bed of blood, then I think it's safe to assume that it did not go down the way that most people think. And honestly, even without George R. R. Martin's statement, the whole story surrounding the Tower of Joy is completely ridiculous. For starters, why were they even fighting? Wouldn't there be at least some sort of conversation between the men to discuss the situation at hand before swords were drawn? After all, Ned is Lyanna's brother and the baby's uncle. And from Ned's perspective, I highly doubt he anticipated there being some sort of resistance to give his sister up, considering Rhaegar was dead and the war was over. Arthur, Gerald, and Oswell had to assume that Ned was going to find them eventually, and when he did, he would want to take his sister home. I mean, this entire war just happened because of her disappearance. We are also told that Ned and Howland Reed, who was slightly bigger than my girlfriend, and five other guys killed three of the most deadly men in Westeros. Then they tore the tower down and used the stone to build eight carns for the men who died there. That is flat out impossible. And if you doubt me, Head on over to the nearest stone building with a buddy of yours and bring a few swords and horses and try and tear it down. It'll take you about 15 years. Ned also took Lyanna's body from the tower so her remains could rest in the crypts at Winterfell, 
along with Arthur's sword, Dawn. So Ned had a corpse, a baby, the most famous sword in all the realm, and let's not forget Lord Dustin's red stallion. According to Barbary Dustin, Ned returned Lord Dustin's red stallion she had given him before he left for war. So did he bring this horse with him to Starfall, and then from Starfall he put the thing on a boat? And then rode the horse from wherever he docked to the Barrowlands? What did he do with the baby? Barbary doesn't mention Ned having a baby with him, and she's a woman with a very long memory. I think she would have mentioned it. And why the hell would Rhaegar hide Lyanna in Dorne, the place where his current wife, whom he is cheating on, is from, and stow her away in a location that is heavily trafficked, being only one of two ways in and out of Dorne? This would imply that there were a lot of potential witnesses to their whereabouts. And given the fact that an entire year went by without anyone figuring out where she was, it seems unlikely. I mean, the way Ned tells it, the three of them were just standing out front, clad head to heel in the white garb of a Kingsguard. This would definitely draw unwanted attention, and would counteract their entire purpose there, which was to defend Liana and her child. Why would they be out in the open instead of taking a defensive position inside the tower, where even greater numbers would have been powerless to get past them on the stairs? Any trained soldier would know to take the high ground and fight downhill. All three of them were experienced warriors and would know this. I mean, Arthur Dane alone could fight 50 guys himself within the narrow confines of a staircase. Speaking of Arthur Dane, the story about his death is another one that makes absolutely no sense. In A Clash of Kings, Bran Three. He recalls a conversation he had with his father about Arthur. The finest knight I ever saw was Sir Arthur Dane, who fought with a blade called Dawn, forged from the heart of a fallen star. They called him the Sword of the Morning, and he would have killed me but for Hal and Reed. Now, first of all, why would Ned have such reverence for a man he had to kill in order to protect his sister? And secondly, Ned never indicates that he killed Arthur in single combat, but that Arthur would have killed him but for Howland Reed. But for is legal ease, which means but for the existence of X would Y have occurred. In this instance, but for the existence of something Howland Reed said or did, X, Arthur would have killed Ned, Y. So basically, Ned didn't kill Arthur Dane, Arthur Dane didn't kill Ned, and Ned never explicitly states that Howland Reed killed Arthur. So, where is he then? So if you haven't already guessed it, we believe that Arthur Dane is alive and has continued doing his sworn duty as a Sword of the Morning by beginning the unification of mankind in preparation for the wars to come. We just know him as Mance Raider. Furthermore, it is our belief that Lyanna was never at the Tower of Joy in the Mountains of Dorne. I know some of you are going to say that Ned recalls Martin Cassell was buried down there somewhere, which seems to be true. The fact is, it is likely that there was some type of skirmish at the Tower of Joy, just not like the one depicted in Ned's fever dream. However, we believe Liana was never there, and was actually quite far away, just like Gerald Hightower said. So, where was she? All right, so here it is, without further ado. It is our belief that Lyanna never left Winterfell, or at the very least, never left the North. And that's what we're going to tell you about in part two. So stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.